For more on May Day and its relevance and the role of unions, we're joined from Philadelphia by Maro Guillen. He's the director of the Lauder Institute at the Wharton School. Maro, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. Maro, is an International Workers' Day, a May Day, still relevant? Well, it is certainly less relevant uh, than, let's say, 10 or 20 or 50 years ago. Uh, the uh, power of unions is on the decline, and uh, there are many doubts uh, uh, in many parts of the world as to to what extent unions contribute to uh, economic welfare. Well, so should the focus of May Day be on income inequality, do you think? Do you think that uh, unions are able to play a role in that? Well, certainly income inequality and wealth inequality are very important topics uh, nowadays. Uh, in many countries around the world, uh, we see an increase in inequality over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. The issue is whether labor unions have contributed to that, labor, to that uh, income inequality or they are in a position to actually uh, ameliorate it, to uh, reduce it. And uh, I believe that in certain parts of the world, especially in Europe, where the unions are very protective of some workers, but not all workers, they've actually contributed to a uh, duality in the labor market. They have contributed to income inequality and wealth inequality. Whereas in other parts of the world, it is possible that unions uh, could help reduce inequality if they bargain for all workers and that uh, they obtain better working conditions and wages for all workers. Well, uh, you raise a good point, and there certainly has been a lot of criticism leveled against unions. In the U.S., there was certainly a time when unions were needed in protecting employees. But now that the laws have changed, is there still a need for unions in a country like the U.S., especially given that many argue that unions are killing business and that they've become too powerful? I mean, unions, let's remember, were a major part of the reason that General Motors and Chrysler got into such a bad state that they had to be bailed out. This is seen in other industries as well. So, Mauro, do you think that unions are actually killing business? Well, unions uh, may be part of the problem in declining industries if uh, they're not willing to compromise, if they're not willing to negotiate, if they're not willing to adjust so that uh, the uh, companies in that industry, let's say here in the United States, uh, can regain their competitiveness. Uh, at the same time, unions could potentially be part of the solution if they adopt a more constructive uh, way of thinking, like, for example, in a country like Germany, where historically they have uh, been so much more conducive uh, to good outcomes in terms of competitiveness. So I think it really depends on the country. Uh, as you mentioned, it also depends on the industry, but it is quite mm -hmm. clear that here in the United States, especially in certain industries, uh, unions like automobiles, unions have tended to uh, undermine the competitiveness of companies. Well, another area in the U.S. where unions have become a problem has been in the education system. Schools are often unable to fire bad teachers or reward good teachers with the merit pay. So the question is, do you think unions have gone too far? And how can union power be reined in or better balanced? If we maintain that there is a need for them, how can we control their power and create more of a balance? Yes, the education sector is a very uh, important one in any country. And here in the United States, the problem, of course, is that, as you know, uh, you know, the private schools do much better than public schools, and especially in some cities uh, where there's a lot of poverty and the tax base is not enough to support those schools. Uh, when you have so many inequalities in terms of the allocation of resources, it's difficult for the unions to play a constructive role because essentially the, what they try is to uh, uh, maintain the jobs, to defend the jobs of their members, as opposed to uh, think uh, more carefully about what is best for the students. Um, so, again, I mean, I think uh, the issue at this root, especially in the education sector, is one of a lack of resources and uh, inequality in terms of the allocation of resources. But more broadly about your question, I think the only way in which unions can be constructive is if they uh, make proposals and if they fight for the rights of all workers, not just their members. That's really the, uh, the most important mm -hmm. thing. Well, whilst we can say that the pendulum has swung uh, too far in countries like the U.S., which countries do you think are most lacking in organized labor and are most behind in workers' rights? Well, I think it's very clearly uh, the case in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, also in parts of the Middle East and uh, South Asia. Uh, recently, uh, you know, uh, Bangladesh made the headlines because uh, uh, hundreds of workers perished in a factory fire, uh, which essentially, uh, you know, conveys very uh, clearly this uh, uh, reality 
in which uh, worker rights are not well protected uh, to the point that uh, uh, you know, their lives are at, at danger because of uh, very poor work, working conditions. Uh, so I think it's mostly, you know, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, the parts of the Middle East and parts of South Asia, where worker rights uh, nowadays uh, are not well protected. And uh, I think uh, uh, there should be better protections of those uh, rights. And again, on the other end of the extreme, we've got countries like Western Europe, where many would argue that workers' rights, as enshrined in the law, are too excessive and are leading to high unemployment and are cramping the global competitiveness. And that's a big part of the problem for the EU. But what do you think about that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So uh, I am originally from Spain and uh, in many parts of uh, Southern Europe and even in parts of Central Europe, the problem is that the unions only represent a small fraction of the labor force. And uh, that uh, part of the labor force, of the labor market, is very well protected. It's very difficult for them to lose their jobs. But at the same time, you have uh, more than half of the population uh, that are not represented by the unions, and they have uh, more informal forms of employment. Uh, it affects particularly the young. And they don't get uh, as uh, good wages and as uh, good uh, working conditions as the workers uh, represented by the unions. So essentially what you have is a, uh, a massive uh, uh, you know, cleavage, a massive uh, gap uh, between those who have good jobs in Europe and those who don't. And then on top of that, of course, you have the unemployed. And as you know, in some of these countries, uh, we're talking about 20 to 25 percent of the uh, mm -hmm. active population that is presently without a job. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. But thank you so much for your insight. Amor Oguien, director of the Lauder Institute at the Wharton School.